But as I'm sure you're all aware, Mark is now the UK government's chief scientific advisor and head of the government office for science. And before this, he was the director of the Wellcome Trust, where he oversaw almost six billion pounds worth of grants for research, as well as the opening of the hugely popular Wellcome Collection. Mark received his knighthood in 209 for services to medical research, and he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society in 2011. He was actually key to creating the Concordat, recommending the formal structure and the process of development that led to the principles of transparency that we could adopt. So I'm really delighted to welcome him to introduce his lecture, Animal Research Then and Now. Mark. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Lots of friends in the audience. So it's a real honour to be asked to give this lecture um, and to follow such distinguished predecessors as uh, Chris Higgins. Um, so in doing research uh, in preparation for this lecture, uh, my chronic bibliomania turned out to be rather useful. So a few years ago, uh, whilst I was undertaking a review of STEM education for the government of the time, I discussed this with the late, <coughs> great Lisa Jardy. And she told me that I should look at the Cavendish Royal Commission report on scientific instruction from 1870 to 1875. Um, and that taught me something that's proved very useful ever since then, which is whenever preparing a report, look at all previous reports, because it's almost certainly all been said before, and probably better. But anyway, to my delight, shortly after uh, Lisa told me to read this, in the Chatsworth Attic sale, a copy of the Cavendish Commission reports, all eight of them, appeared, and I duly became the owner of the Duke of Devonshire's personal <coughs> copy of his Royal Commission reports. If I can find the button to move the slides. <coughs> uh, the reason I haven't got it is because it isn't here. That's it. Thank you. Um, uh, but uh, Victorian Royal Commission reports are nothing if not deeply specialist. Uh, they're neither distinguished by their typography or by their illustrations. So they're relatively little financial value. So this particular lot was padded with a string of other equally esoteric Royal Commission reports, which meant that the transport costs were almost as great as the costs of the books themselves. But amongst the other reports I acquired was the 1876 Royal Commission on Vivisection. And that is an illustration of uh, the Duke of Devonshire, Cavendish's own copy of um, uh, the Royal Commission report on Vivisection. Um, I also acquired at the same time the 1849 report on the application of iron to railway structures. Uh, so I'm looking forward in due course to lecturing on this topic as well. <laughs> um, but seriously, both of the first two of these reports have turned out to be extremely useful. And many of the arguments that they contained then are as valid today as they were 140 years ago. Um, and so references to animal research have existed in culture since at least Shakespeare's time. But from the 1850s onwards, a concomitant with the rise of physiology, um, and also stimulated by the discovery of the anaesthetics, chloroform and ether, there was quite an active debate in both the public and the specialist press about the propriety of experiments on living animals. And the appointments of professors of physiology at a small number of British universities fueled the debate. So at the meeting of the British Association in Edinburgh in 1871, a Sir James Paget, a distinguished Victorian physician and father of the Stephen Paget whom we commemorate tonight, uh, laid a series of resolutions which were passed. And these included the first. Firstly, no experiment that can be performed under the influence of an anaesthetic um, ought to be done without it. And secondly, no painful experiment is justifiable for the mere purpose of illustrating a law or fact already demonstrated. Uh, so the Royal Commission, which was initiated on the 22nd of June 1875, its purpose was to inquire into the practice of subjecting live animals to experiments for scientific purposes, and to consider and report what measures, if any, it may be desirable to take um, in respect of any such practice. 
And those royal commissioners, who were a very distinguished bunch, included Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, who also was part of the Commission on Science Instruction. Uh, it's interesting, the initiation of the, the Commission was the 22nd of June 1875, and the report itself was issued on the 8th of January 1876, so they got on with their work. Uh, the report commendably was in fact only 15 pages in length. Uh, but for those of us that worry about evidence-based um, reports, it was backed up with 6,551 paragraphs of evidence. Um, and it makes absolutely fascinating reading. Um, the list of witnesses is extraordinary. Uh, so Sir James Paget was joined by some of the founding uh, parents of physiology, including William Sharp, Sharpie um, and J. Burton Sanderson. Other luminaries who gave evidence included Joseph Lister, uh, Charles Darwin, Sir William Gull, um, and a panoply of the great and the good of 19th century science and medicine. And a few quotes from the report itself will suffice to indicate its general tenor. So, it has been proposed to enact that the object in view shall be some immediate application of some expected discovery to some prophylactic or therapeutic end, and that any experiment made for the mere advancement of science should be rendered unlawful. Uh, but this proposal cannot be sustained by reflection upon the actual course of human affairs. Knowledge goes before the application of knowledge, and the application of the discovery is seldom foreseen when the discovery is made. Who, says Helmholtz, when Galvani touched the legs of frogs with different meccas and noticed their contraction, could have dreamt that all Europe would be tra traversed with wires, flashing intelligence from Madrid to St. Petersburg with the speed of lightning. And of course that was right then, and it is true now, and it's a nice enunciation of the justification and the importance of the conducting of basic research led by curiosity into answering important scientific questions. So then, as now, uh, in the Commission, the report and the evidence, examples were given of discoveries important to the advancement of human health. So these included the discovery of the circulation of blood, so Harvey, commemorated here by the Harvey Declaration, the discovery of the lacteal and the lymphatic system of vessels, and Sir Charles Bell's discovery of the compound function of the spinal nerves, the, set, the sensory and emotive functions. And at the time, uh, Sir James Paget identified the challenge of discovering an antidote to snake poisons, citing the many thousands of your majesty's Indian subjects who perish annually from snake bites. And indeed, less than 20 years later, César Fizalix and Gabriel Bertrand, together with Albert Calmet, presented to the French Society of Biology on the 10th of February 1894 their independent work on the development of an antivenom against viper venom and Indian cobra venom, respectively. And it was only a few years later that Vital Brazil, head of the Butantan Institute in Sao Paulo, developed the first antisera to, to South American poisonous snakes. So amongst the witnesses to the Royal Commission was Charles Darwin. And to quote him briefly, the first thing I would say is that I am fully convinced that physiology can progress only by the aid of experiments on living animals. I cannot think of any one step which has been made in physiology without that aid. And Darwin was then asked, now with regard to trying a painful experiment without anaesthetics, when the same experiment could be made with anaesthetics, or in short, inflicting any pain that was not absolutely necessary upon an animal, what would be your view on that subject? And his reply, it deserves detestation and abhorrence. Uh, but the evidence that probably had the greatest impact of all was that of a, a Dr. Emmanuel Klein, uh, who was a physiologist working as an assistant professor in the Brown Institute. Um, and the Brown Institute, incidentally, <coughs> is located roughly where um, the Secret Intelligence Service has its headquarters just south of Lambeth Bridge. Um, but anyway, uh, or one, uh, Vauxhall Bridge, rather. Um, and he appeared uh, completely insensitive to the suffering of animals. And Huxley wrote to Darwin on October the 30th, after Klein had provided his evidence, 
the Commission is playing the deuce with me. I have felt it my duty to act as Council for Science and was well satisfied with the way things are going. But on Thursday, when I was absent, um, X, but it was Dr. Klein, was examined. And if what I hear is a correct account of the evidence he gave, I may as well throw up my brief. I'm told he openly professed the most entire indifference to animal suffering, and he only gave anaesthetics to keep the animals quiet. I declare to you, I did not believe the man lived who was such an unmitigated cynical brute as to profess and act upon such principles, and I willingly agree to any law that would send him to the tribunal. Uh, the impression his evidence made on Cardwell and Foster, two of the other commissioners, is profound, and I am powerless, even if I desire, which I have not, to combat it. And in fact, it's extremely interesting to read the evidence that Klein gave and the correspondence he subsequently had with the commissioners when he realised that his account was going to be published verbatim. Um, but, um, and that's a lesson to anyone who appears before select committees. <laughs> um, uh, but the Royal Commission report uh, duly, and I think inevitably, concluded that legislation was necessary. Um, and to quote again, uh, what we would humbly recommend to Your Majesty would be the enactment of a law by which experiments upon living animals, whether for original research or for demonstration, should be placed under the control of the Secretary of State who should have powers to grant licences to persons, and when satisfied of the propriety of doing so, to withdraw them. No other person should be permitted to perform experiments. The holders of licences should be bound by conditions, and breach of those conditions should entail the liability to forfeiture of the licence. Uh, the object of the conditions should be to ensure that suffering should never be inflicted in any case in which it could be afforded, avoided, and should be reduced to a minimum where it could not be altogether avoided. The first statement in a way of the three R's. Uh, the government, uh, not surprisingly, listened, um, and the result was a bill placing animal experimentation in Great Britain, uh, akin to the study of human anatomy, under the supervision of the law. Um, and this was enacted as the Cruelty to Animals Act on August the 15th, 1876. Of course, everyone here will realise this was by no means the end of the history. There was another Royal Commission between 1906 and 1912. Um, that took much longer and in the end largely confirmed the status quo. And finally, of course, in 1986, the 1876 Act <coughs> was replaced by the Animals Scientific Procedures Act. And this the big change here was it authorised animal experimenters by means of a personal licence, but an additional project licence that defined the categories of purpose. And that, of course, is where we are today. So it's an enormous privilege to be asked to give the 80th Paget Lecture this evening. Um, and Stephen Paget, in whose memory this series of lectures was instituted in 1927, was a, and this, is, of course, is an illustration of uh, Stephen Paget was a tireless advocate for the value of properly conducted animal research and indeed wrote a book setting out examples of where research on animals had advanced uh, human knowledge and health. Um, and his work to found the Research Defence Society in 1908 during that second Royal Commission on Vivisection was a turning point in the national debate around animal research. Um, and of course the Research Defence Society was formed to make known the facts as to experiments on animals in this country, the immense importance to the welfare of mankind of such experiments, and the great saving of human life and health directly attributable to them. And I think Stephen Paget would find today's discourse as familiar as we find the arguments of the 1870s. Uh, but this is not a lecture on history, although you may think it is. Um, the introduction is intended to show that all of the concerns that continue to rear their head about research using animals have a very long history. And these concerns sit at the interface between the conduct of science, the application of science, and the human values held by individuals and societies in different so what are the core arguments around animal research? In truth, they're still the same 
as those articulated clearly in the 1870s. They are fundamentally utilitarian arguments about one sort of value, the value of scientific research in discovering the secrets of human and animal biology in health and disease. And this work brings with it the potential to prevent disease through vaccination, for example, or to treat it as with the use of insulin in diabetes. And that value is balanced against another sort of value, which is our relationship with other species and the extent to which we are prepared to cause harm to other species to bring benefits to ourselves. And I fear that all too often, discussions about science are conflated with arguments about values. So we end up with arguments that are framed as follows. The proponents argue for the necessity of animal research if we're to progress in our understanding of health and disease and to discover new preventive and therapeutic approaches. Opponents of animal research argue that the research is scientifically valid, that the results are not transferable from one species to another, and that experiments cause unacceptable suffering. But this is actually not the real argument. It's an argument that's being conducted at cross-purposes. The reality is that there are some people who believe that it is simply wrong to experiment on animals, whatever the potential benefit. Um, equally, there are some in the scientific community who don't recognise that, in the face of all the benefits that they perceive from such research, that it is reasonable that some people oppose the use of animals in research from the perspective of their personal values. Um, and of course, in fact, it's much more complicated than this, because many who don't like the idea of animal research express gradations of concern about research on other species. Um, and these concerns are based on judgments of perceived hierarchies. Uh, so one hierarchy is partly based on perceptions of the capacity of different species to experience pain or suffering. Um, or the other set of arguments, which is related, is on the basis of their evolutionary relationship to humans. So there tends to be less concern about invertebrates, but of course the exception of cephalopods, and then successively more concern moving from fish to mice to rats to rabbits, uh, with cats, dogs and non-human primates the objects of the most concern. And of course that reflects the different relationships with the, we have with other species where um, cats and dogs are the best friends of many human beings, um, and human primates are seen to be our close relatives. But this complexity means that animal research is a topic where the institutions of science meet the institutions of democracy fairly and squarely. Um, and frankly, it's in areas where the arguments will continue and the opposing cases will need to be made and remade. This is not a discussion that will ever have an end as such. Uh, we live in a plural democratic society where different citizens hold different views based on differing moral precepts. And ultimately, it is for democratic governments, and indeed other governments, to decide on the acceptability and conditions under which research on animals is undertaken and how this should be regulated. Um, and this is an area in which the UK is a global leader. Um, so my life in science started with experiments on the genetics of the fruit fly in school laboratories in the 1960s. Uh, dissection of frogs and the extremely smelly formaldehyde pickled dogfishes, uh, which provided ample confirmation to me, if it was ever needed, that I was neither going to be an anatomist nor a surgeon. Um, it was medical school that provided my first insights, really, into research on uh, mammalian species, um, studying immune responses to mice, to chemically induced tumours, as part of my Part 2 pathology course in Cambridge, and participation as a medical elective student at the Karolinska Institute in research on a strain of mice uh, called C3H-HEJ. Now, this strain of mice shows no response to exposure to lipopolysaccharide, uh, which is a component of many bacterial cell walls that's a cause of the damaging inflammatory response suffered by animals 
infected with certain bacteria. And so my task as a, an elected medical student in a couple of months was to work out the explanation for this failure of responsiveness of the C3H HEJ mouse to lipopolysaccharide. And I worked very hard. I isolated lymphocytes from these and controlled mice and checked whether they respond to stimuli other than lipopolysaccharide, which they did. But I didn't get anywhere near to uncovering the explanation for how they failed to respond to LPS. Nor, I have to confess, did I understand at the time uh, the importance of these particular mice and why it mattered to discover the explanation for lipopolysaccharide unresponsiveness. Uh, so you can imagine my fascination uh, when Dr. Bruce Beutler was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2011 <laughs> for discovering that these mice were genetically deficient in a protein called toll-like receptor 4. Um, and this is an important part of the innate immune system that confers inherited resistance to bacterial and other infections and is a member of a group of proteins that have been conserved over a very long period of evolution with very similar toll receptors present in those fruit flies that I studied at school although there the genetics was to just understand the Mendelian principles or laws around um, eye colour uh, and various um, uh, mutations uh, with either dominant or recessive effect. Um, but the, the deeper point is that this and related discoveries has opened up a whole new field of research into our immune responses in both health and disease and is a good example of how apparently rather basic research inquiries, in this case firstly in flies and then in rodents, turn out to have important utility in understanding the mechanisms of ill health. Going back to that quote from the original World Commission report about the importance of basic research and experiments with animals, providing the deep understanding that enables later application of knowledge. So once the arguments about animal research have been conserved through the generations, there is one important respect, and it's already come up this evening, uh, in which the landscape for animal research has changed significantly during the last 30 years or so. Uh, for a long time, the laws that ensure that animals used in research are treated as humanely as possible have been enforced. However, the laws protecting scientists from illegal harassment by extremists were not. And that asymmetry has disappeared in recent years. As scientists can practice their, le their, their legal experimental work, confident that the government will support them against extremism. And so since the days of a brave few who were prepared to talk openly about their research in, on animals, more and more scientists are willing to make the case in public for the research that they undertake. Animal labs and their host institutions are increasingly open and the sky has not fallen in. And it's worth reflecting on how remarkable that change has been. Huge progress has been made in opening up animal research to public scrutiny, particularly in the academic community, and of course these awards this evening reflect that and the worthy array of winners. However, the argument hasn't been won in all parts of the animal research community, and I think we must continue to make the case to our peers for intelligent transparency. Too often the answer is still to hope that no one asks questions of us, rather than to open the doors and show there's nothing to fear. But importantly, of course, this openness cannot and should not be left to the academic community alone. Industry needs animal research as well, and whilst some industry is very open, that's not the case in all cases. And so industry voices would therefore be a persuasive part of making the public case for why animal research remains necessary. Um, and of course in 2012, following discussions at the Wellcome Trust between the Science Media Centre and the Wellcome Trust, there was a further series of discussions, and uh, Jeff Watts played an important role, um, which led to over 40 organisations working in the biosciences in the UK signing a declaration on openness on animal research. And that, of course, included a commitment to developing a concordat which set out how they would be more open about the ways in which animals are used in scientific, medical and veterinary research in the UK. 
Um, in 2014, the Concordat was launched, and you saw the array of signatories today. And I think that the individuals who've been willing to stand up and to make the case for animal research throughout the years can claim a great deal of credit for the state that we now find ourselves in. So it's only right that we celebrate their achievements this evening, and it's a very good opportunity to thank the successor organisation to the Research Defence Society, Understanding Animal Research, for the work that you do. Um, and Fiona Fox and uh, your uh, colleagues at the Science Media Centre also thanks for your work on encouraging openness. The Concordat has, I believe, been helpful and I would encourage every institution involved in animal research to sign up. But I would say that amidst the fervour for encouraging openness and much more communication, I believe there is some, occasionally some danger of overreaction. We want volunteers for communication about animal research, not conscripts. Not everyone is able and willing to communicate effectively, and the model channels for abuse are manifold. And a thick skin is needed by those who communicate science in some of the more controversial areas of science. Indeed, enthusiasts for science communication often fail to recognise that it isn't a singular thing. A science communication comes in many forms. Uh, it's much easier to communicate science discoveries, such as the Higgs boson, or to enthuse people about space science, than it is to communicate the role of science in areas where there are conflicting human values. That's not to say that it's easy to explain Higgs boson, but here the challenge is not the general public, it's actually other particle physicists who are all too ready to shoot down some hapless colleague who doesn't fully communicate the arcana correctly. Um, and it reminds me of when I went on the Today programme a few years ago to talk about the potential importance of a new genetically modified potato that was resistant to potato blight. And I explained that blight was caused by a fungus that could devastate potato crops. Um, on that occasion, it wasn't anti-GMO activists who objected to my interview on this occasion. It was a letter from a gardening pundit who accused me of extreme ignorance in calling potato blight a fungus. Uh, because it is, in fact, an oomycete, uh, which Wikipedia will tell you is a distinct phylogenetic lineage of fungus-like eukaryotic microorganisms. Um, they didn't actually teach me that at medical school. Um, and indeed, I don't think it was even known when I was at medical school. Uh, but I'm not sure that the point of the interview would have been enhanced by this particular element of taxonomic rigour. Um, the reality is that scientists who participate in public discussions on embryo research, on animal research, on GMOs, on pesticides, on climate science and the like will have an utterly different experience from those that talk about science in areas that are not value laden. And indeed, scientists sometimes fail to recognise that how science is used is a topic for all of society. And as scientists, our views do not trump the views of others. Um, but coming back to the Uamaisi for a second, uh, please don't think that I'm making a case for any kind of post-truth approach to science <laughs> communication. I'm absolutely not. Uh, one of the big challenges for science is to become even more rigorous in the way that we conduct research and communicate its results. And indeed, I think one of the problems in the way in which science is communicated is the overemphasis on the reporting of the latest paper on X or Y, <coughs> rather than on what the body of the scientific evidence shows. And frankly, this causes endless problems to those of us that are involved in providing science advice to government. By and large, we're not that interested simply in what the latest paper shows, especially when it's apparently equal and opposite to the paper that was published last week. <laughs> and what we care about is the totality of evidence. What do we know overall? What do we not know? And where are the uncertainties? Um, and so where animal research remains necessary, we must clearly and confidently explain why. 
but we should hold ourselves to the same standard of evidence and communication as we'd expect in our science itself. We mustn't be seduced by our own PR. And here I have a challenge to this audience. To what extent have we as a community ever subjected our claims about how vital animal research has been to human health to the same level of scrutiny we'd apply to those claiming to have discovered a new cure? And I think if not, we must. And I think that a Cochrane Standard review <coughs> of the contribution of animal research to advances in health <coughs> and well-being over the last 20 years or so would be a valuable contribution. And I think that's a challenge to you as an audience tonight. I would really like to see a first-rate meta-analysis done to a very rigorous standard in the same way that you would expect a Cochrane review on a treatment or a preventive in medicine to apply to the whole area of animal research. Um, so, uh, developing and maintaining a supportive environment for research um, I think is both more difficult and more necessary in animal research than it is in less controversial branches of science. Um, people talk a lot about trust, so animal research must command public trust. Uh, but as um, Baroness O'Neill is always saying, the corollary of trust is trustworthiness. And we earn trust by being trustworthy. Uh, we cannot be complacent in our maintenance of what we have earned. Therefore, the animal research community needs to behave in a fashion that is irrefutably trustworthy. And so set in this context, a robust regulatory environment is not a burden to be borne by those who would do animal research. It is an integral part of the case that we make to society in the UK. Members of the public can be confident that we're trustworthy precisely because we are so carefully regulated and because we obey those regulations. And it follows that we, as a research community, must share responsibility for how we're regulated. And I know my colleagues in the Home Office would welcome more dialogue with the scientific community. Um, however, it would be a mistake for us to interpret that as an invitation to dictate to the Home Office what we want, or for special pleading. And um, the Chief Inspector in the Home Office, Dr Culverwell, in the 1940s, pointed out once to some unfortunate colleagues, no one ever tells the Home Office what to do. <laughs> Rather, I think we should re approach discussions with the Home Office in the spirit of partnership, uh, politely suggesting improvements which would better ensure animal welfare and promote the best science. And this brings me to an issue which should be close to the heart of any scientist. Uh, we can never be complacent uh, in the pursuit of rigour. As scientists, we must constantly ask ourselves, does this study meet the highest standards of work? And we must be ruthless in challenging where we see this is not the case, in the work we do ourselves and in the wider research community. And as I'm sure everyone here will agree, there can't be a choice between high standards on the one hand and a high volume of research on the other. It's the standards that trump everything. So if we're to make the most of the funding that's available, the correct approach is to prioritise the best, the most reliable work, and this is particularly true if animals are involved. It is frankly unethical and wrong to conduct poorly powered studies statistically. So experiments should always be designed to provide the best chance of generating robust and reliable results. Uh, that doesn't, of course, take away the need for repetition of experiments to confirm or to refute important findings. But ultimately, we will use the fewest animals in experiments overall if we optimise the experimental designs to give the greatest chance of reliable findings. And so with that in mind, uh, the ongoing work to standardise approaches around the world is entirely welcome, and we should be proud in the UK uh, for having some of the highest standards for animal testing in the world. And of course, where other countries' systems meet those standards, we can use their results in our regulatory processes. Uh, this is both efficient and good for animal welfare. And this is responsibility for everyone in the scientific endeavour. So it's a responsibility for the funders of research, it's a responsibility for the researchers themselves, and it's a responsibility of those that peer review their papers and publish the findings 
to insist on the highest standards of work and in doing so drive welfare internationally. And whilst I don't anticipate a point in my lifetime when animal research will be entirely unnecessary, we must continue to ask ourselves, is there a better way? Uh, worldwide, the supply chain for animals, of animals research is fragile. Um, and global public opinion, as anyone who reads the newspaper on any day of the week at the moment, um, is quite hard to focus. Um, and it may harden against testing at some point. What pharma company would continue the expense and reputation risks of animal tests if they didn't have to? What government wouldn't welcome the avoidance of political controversy? What scientists would want to keep using an imperfect animal model if a more accurate alternative existed? And so the UK should continue to lead the process of finding alternatives. And that means that the work of the NC3Rs, the National Centre for Replacement, Refinement and Reduction of Animal Research, is extremely important. And of course, the truth is that the extraordinary tools of modern medi biomedical research often ways to unravel physiology at the level of the cell, the organ, and the organism in ways that were inconceivable <coughs> even a few years ago. And so in his philosophical poem, An Essay on Man, Alexander Pope wrote in 1733, Know then thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. And that's a rather splendid illustration that comes from the Wellcome Trust images site um, of uh, Pope's work. So our tools now let us study man and woman in the most extraordinary detail and with minimal innovation. But not all of our tools can or indeed should be applied in um, humans. For example, the power of optogenetics to study neural circuitry or gene editing to create an array of genetic variation offers opportunities to ask important questions about, for example, the function and the malfunction of the nervous system in animals in ways that simply cannot be achieved in humans. And these results are very important for our understanding of humans. Uh, we are in an extraordinary time for science, engineering, technology and social science. Uh, so the Government Office for Science periodically produces reports on technology innovation futures. And our most recent report concludes that what is happening at the moment is a convergence between technologies. Uh, for example, biology meets material science, uh, engineering and big data. So the opportunities and the importance of animal research remains as salient now as it has ever been so. But we should never forget that the pursuit of science does require a public license. <coughs> Not least because it is the taxpayer that funds much of our basic research. And the return to the taxpayer comes in many forms. Of course, advances in knowledge matter in their own right. But ultimately they're not sufficient on their own. The public expects gains in health and well-being and gains the economy from the many billions of pounds that are invested in research and development. Science, engineering, technology and the social sciences are at the heart of advances in industry and the economy. And the UK, as everyone here knows, is a world leader in the biosciences. And in that context, animal research is an essential and integral part of the jigsaw of the UK knowledge economy. Um, so I will end where I began. The lesson of history is that some things don't change. So we must be resolute in continuing to make the case for animal research. 108 years after the Research Defence Society was formed, their founding purpose to make known the facts about animal research needs but one update. We've learned as a community that knowing the facts is not enough. People must be engaged, involved in, and ultimately persuaded by the utility of our work. And in 2016, of all years, no one needs reminding of the dangers of assuming the wider public shares the views of experts. But furthermore, the claim of expertise does need careful examination. A true expert should behave with impeccable and dispassionate rigour, properly acknowledging uncertainty where this exists. 
And I'm not sure that all self-declared or indeed anointed experts always live up to these standards. One can't hope to convince everyone. However, on animal research, it's necessary in a democracy to bring on board the widest possible coalition of the public. The age-old arguments about the pros and cons of animal research have not been resolved, and maybe never will be. They sit at the heart about the debate about our relationship of humans with other species. And they tell us something important about one of the unique attributes of humans. Uh, the tiger doesn't debate whether it's right to bring down and strangle the gazelle with a bite of its neck. Eat or be eaten, nature, red in tooth and claw. But we humans have what appears to be the unique cognitive ability to consider our relationship with other species. Uh, it's the essence of humanity that we care for each other in extraordinary ways and care for other species and our environment. They're almost certainly not enough, given the environmental challenges that come with a global population of over 7 billion people. And Alexander Pope reminds us of the paradox at the core of humans, even in an era of enlightenment. Chaos of thought and passion, all confused. It was Hume that noted that the passions often trump reason. Scientists who are human, and not, I would suggest, immune from passion, must continue to promote reason. And so I think there are a few things, I suggest, that this mission to promote reason requires of the animal research community. Firstly, keep talking to government about where the regulations could work better to ensure high standards of research and animal welfare but challenge where you see examples of these standards not being upheld by the community. Secondly, let us maintain the UK's position as a world leader in the most rigorous animal research, but also in the search for alternatives. And thirdly, welcome scrutiny for the confidence it provides. Keep talking about what research is undertaken. Keep opening the doors. And let us submit our own arguments for the value of animal research to the same scrutiny we would apply to all of our scientific work. We cannot fear openness, we must embrace it. Thank you for your attention. Questions, questions or comments or thoughts on what he's told us? Yeah, there's one there. Go for it. There's, um, a mic, there's a mic coming, but you could shout out if you like. And do tell me who you are. Um, I'm Donald Bruce. I'm ethicist by training, uh, a former nuclear regulator. It's a long, long time ago. Um, but currently, I'm a new member of the Animals and Science Committee and the main member of one of the animals. Um a long experience of my own in ethics, I'm delighted to hear your comment about the rigour at which you apply things. Um, working in the nuclear industry many, many years ago, we were told that nuclear was wonderful because it replaced the dirty coal. Then we were told that wind power was wonderful because it replaced the horrible nuclear. And then somebody objected to a wind initiative in Peebles said, this act of environmental terrorism, and the consistent threat through them is that you blow up the problems of what you don't like, and you exaggerate the benefits, and the lack of rigor. Now, I've never seen that consistently achieved, so what's going to have to change in order to um, achieve that? Well, because it, yeah. it, doesn't, it hasn't happened very much in my experience. Okay, well, thank you for the question, and sometime offline we should maybe talk about nuclear regulation, but that's another matter. But, but it's a good opportunity because you illustrate the issue that comes up again and again, which is where science, engineering, and technology comes into conflict with values. And so energy is another area where there are very powerful values, as you know yourself. 
um, radiation is value laden. It's a sort of invisible um, set of humors, as it were, that it uh, brings uh, death and destruction in its way. And so, you know, the serious point is that, and this varies in different countries and different parts of the world, people have strong value feelings, personal value feelings, against nuclear. And so, again, we tend to conflate the argument, which is whether nuclear is safe or unsafe. And, of course, all the evidence is that nuclear power is an extremely safe force of air, a form of energy production, and it's much safer than coal. Um, but that's not really the discussion. It's, it's framed as a scientific argument when really there are two discussions. There's the human values discussion about whether this stuff called radiation, and then there's the science on the other hand. And of course that applies to almost every domain of energy. So the other one, which is very active at the moment, is discussion about uh, fracking, um, so hydraulic fracturing of shale, where the science and engineering questions are threefold. There, um, firstly, is it going to cause seismicity and earth tremors? Secondly, are we going to get contamination in the water table? And thirdly, will there be fugitive release of methane gas causing a uh, release of greenhouse gases? Those are the science and engineering issues. And there are umpteen reports showing that when it is, when it is properly engineered, <coughs> this is a, you know, an acceptable thing to do. But there's the separate discussion about uh, some people not liking fossil fuels at all, other people not liking the companies that produce fossil fuels, and other people not liking the industrial infrastructure that goes with um, uh, uh, the Frankfurt process. But we conflate the arguments. So the argument is turned into a it's good science or it's bad science, as opposed to recognizing that both sides have legitimate positions, and ultimately it's for democratic societies to collectively decide how to resolve these issues. And that's the point about animal research. We live in a plural society. People are entitled to different views. And ultimately, it's for Parliament to resolve those differences. But my plea is to avoid having the discussion <coughs> at cross purposes and to be absolutely clear in the terms of the discussion. Do you want to take from the example of Frankenstein? See exactly that's what you Well, I mean, and I've worked closely with Joyce. Uh, and we, we produced an annual report on, uh, on innovation, managing the risk rather than simply avoiding it. Um, volunteers, not conscripts. Um, yeah. I couldn't help thinking that might be slightly aimed at me because I'm rather <laughs> partial to conscripting. Um, yes, I couldn't part, possibly comment. But but partly <laughs> because, back to the rigour, partly because some of the arguments used against are not based on evidence and lack rigour. And I just find that really frustrating when I'm talking to scientists who repeatedly say to me that we will be targeted. That there will, you know, it's all right for you, Fiona. There will be a bomb under my car. Were, and at an institutional level, we're still hearing very, you know, you talk about the history, very out of date arguments about the threat from the activists, and no attempt to find out from the police or the anti-terrorists or UAR what the real level of threat is. So I, I feel like we should be okay, not conscious, <coughs> no one has to do it. And I totally agree with your distinction between particle physics and arguments based on values. But I do think we shouldn't let people. There are lots of pharmaceutical companies and institutions, you're aware, I email you uh, when I see the institutions still not doing this and leaving it to the people in this room who have won all these awards. And I think we do have to challenge I think them. I think the institutions we should uh, challenge, but I do think we have to recognise that this type of science communication is not that easy. Um, it's much, much easier to talk about the Higgs boson on the media. Even if you talk complete rubbish, people will believe you. The second you engage in a topic like genetically modified organisms or animal research, it is a much tougher experience. Um, and so uh, a lot of training is needed. And I would maintain that you need volunteers. And not everyone is, as you know, good at communication. Um, and uh, so, as I say, I don't think you, you, you can't force people to do it. You have to persuade them that it's something they want to do and recognise that not everyone is as good at it as others. Um, and I think recognise that the experience does feel different depending on what you're communicating. <coughs> and also the position from which you're communicating. So I make no comment other than say the experience of communicating science when you're the director of the Wellcome Trust is a different experience from communicating science when you're the chief scientific advisor to HM government. 
Yes, I, no, I, mean, I, I agree with the organisation. If organisations are seen to be secretive, yes. then people assume bad things are happening, even if they're not. Um, I think that's exactly right. I, I accept the organisation point, and of course that can be done through uh, the sorts of website that you see. So you, do, you don't necessarily have, to have people standing up and giving speeches or appearing on the radio. Uh, you can be transparent in many ways, and so I agree with that. I don't know if there's any other journalists in the room, but as a journalist, I, I concur with what you say that some people are just not good communicators mm. and other people are naturals. Yeah. One of the challenges that I addressed when I was the other side of the fence and trying to persuade people to talk for the organisations I work for was the um, criticism and lack of support from their peers. Yes. And I have seen time and time again people do a really quite good job at a media interview, as good a job as anyone would do, um, and then suffer sometimes, frankly, abuse because they didn't quite say it the way, mm -hmm. with the rigor perhaps, or whatever some scientists would see. So I think there's a, there's a, a space between what scientists see as good communication and actually what the public hear. And yeah. humanity is what most people who are scientists need to understand that science is driven and done by people with great humanity and great patience and great concentration. And um, that's part of the message, is to talk about who they are and why they're doing things and not just what they're doing. No, I couldn't agree more. That's why I told the Uomasi story. Because, because it, 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 is, it is the point that actually... Um, there is a, a minority of people who do communicate science and do it on the media and do it well, who uh, are abused by their colleagues at least as much as they are by anyone else, and that is completely unacceptable. Um, well, if I could add one, you can oh, well, Here we are, yes. Hang on. challenge to do a very good meta-analysis, because I just don't think that exists. And so um, uh, people are always coming out with you know, a rather small number of examples. I think there are probably many more examples. Where is the meta-analysis of what animal search has contributed over the last 25 years? I, don't, I mean, someone could tell me if it exists, but I'm not sure. I, if, if it exists, I haven't found it. <coughs> Assuming it doesn't exist, who do you think is the right kind of person or group of people to try and draw that together? I'm not sure it's necessarily the people in this room. Well, it, it, I mean, ultimately, well, it comes down to a rather fundamental issue, which is I think there is a cultural issue in science about this focus on this single original paper at the expense of the meta-analysis. I mean, the first thing you're supposed to do when you write a PhD, and of course it's always the last thing, <laughs> is write the literature review. <laughs> And it's usually when you write the literature review at the end that you discover something, it would have been quite useful to know. <laughs> but it is actually part of the rigor of writing a PhD. Um, what people do endlessly is write these reviews, and they write the same review in sort of slightly different forms about 20 times. It would be much better if people actually focused much more on that sort of rather more rigorous meta analysis. Um, and so I think that, you know, I. I'm sure there are people in this audience who are qualified to do it, but there is a methodology for doing meta-analyses. Uh, it was medicine, it was my medicine that really invented it, because it was so important to know that you were treating people, that evidence-based medicine relies on um, the uh, accretion of knowledge, and it's, it's bringing it all together. And I don't think that there's nearly enough of that. And it's something you really appreciate when you're in the business of advising government. 
So in two sort of um, straightforward areas, which is bovine tuberculosis and neonatal mm -hmm. pesticides, my life and Ian Boyd, who's my colleague at DEFRA, has been made much easier by the work that Charles Godfrey and Angela McLean have led in Oxford, uh, producing really good, rigorous meta-analyses of the science evidence in both of these areas. That's what we need. Okay. Any more questions? Ah, Wendy, yes. Thanks so much for doing the lecture today. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, as you'll have seen, we've got probably the majority now of organisations in the UK yeah. have signed the Concord Act. There are clearly some organisations that carry out animal research that haven't signed the mm -hmm. Concord Act yet. And I wonder if, if you were trying to persuade them that it was a good thing to sign up, what sort of messages would you give them? Well, I suppose I've just been happen? talking for about 45 minutes giving messages. I think it's, it's, I think it's the... the you know, well, it's, it's, take this away. It's, it's the narrative that... I, I think that is the narrative. Um, um, but, I, I mean, I, you know, in some senses, you've achieved fantastic things with the Concordat. Um, and, of course, Fiona and I had some conversations about the creation of it right at the very beginning. Um, I don't think, actually, the answer now is just to get more and more signatures on the Concordat. I think, actually, the challenge is to keep communicating. You've got an awful lot of communication there. Just make the most of it. Get people out there talking about it. Um, and I would say, you know, you're, you're doing very well. But I, don't, I, I just think it's a mistake to believe that this is a task of work and at some point it will be done. And that's the end of it. It will never be done. In another, you know, the 180th Paget Lecture, will probably be the same lecture, essentially. <laughs> because the arguments won't change. It is a perfectly legitimate position to not want to do animal research. There is nothing wrong with it as a position. In a plural society, we just have to resolve the fact that there are the different arguments, that there is a powerful utilitarian argument, but not everyone is utilitarian. There is no right answer. Hmm. Okay, I think on that interesting note, unless there's any more questions out there, it's just up to me again to thank Mark for a fantastic lecture and for you to do... Oh. But just before you do, I want to thank Tom Wells from my office who's sitting there for uh, all the work he's <coughs> done. And also the Chief Inspector from the Home Office is sitting here as well. Thank you. So thank you, Chief. Okay. Thank you, Martin.